Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, you know the TV industry is having as tough, if not a tougher time, than the radio industry during this coronavirus and social distancing. Rob Ashard is probably the number one A1 go-to TV audio guy in England. Well, at least I think he is. And he's going to tell us about what's happening there, how workflows have changed, and some of the cool hacks that he and others have come up with. Coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store, with outstanding service, savings, and support, online at bgs.cc. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, keeping you connected with your community with support and webinars. Online at nautel.com slash webinars. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. I tell you, this past week I had experience <laughs> with both. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. This is the 493rd episode of This Week in Radio Tech. It's about radio engineering and uh, sometimes we talk about audio engineering and digital engineering, all the things that have to do with uh, with audio. Uh, I'm in the Telos Alliance studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, still doing the social distancing thing, mostly staying at home. And I really appreciate the Telos Alliance uh, giving me an hour, hour and a half every uh, Thursday to do the show and to provide some equipment that we have around here to help us uh, do the show and, and uh, learn about new technologies and techniques for, to uh, handle broadcasting, especially radio broadcasting. So we had a beautiful day here in Nashville. We had uh, actually uh, the Navy Blue Angels flew over Nashville today. They did several loop-de-loops all around the city, not vertical loops, but horizontal, uh, made their way in racetrack form around the city. And, and that was kind of a fun diversion took my son out to a soccer field and watched them fly over. It, did, it, it was all over in 12 seconds, but we had a good time with, with that. And understand the Blue Angels also made a visit to New York City a few days ago. And Chris Tobin is here. Chris, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. How you doing? Why, thank you. Yes, they did. They, they did a flyover. It was very nice. Quite enjoyable. It's always nice seeing fighter jets going across the sky. It's always good. <laughs> long, the weather long here, long too, is very what? sunny and blue sky. Yeah, as long as they're not carrying weaponry, then then you got to worry. Well, they can carry it as long as they're not uh, <laughs> setting it off and you know, hot, you know, trigger hot and go. You know, that, that we're okay. <laughs> I'm I'm just guessing that the Blue Angels don't carry in, any weaponry. I guess they're not allowed to say. I no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure can, they don't. Sure they don't. Can, can neither confirm nor nor deny. No well, deny. it's good to see you. You've got a you've got a bright sunny day there. We do, I'm inside, but you're outside uh, enjoying some fresh air and uh, and non COVID uh, uh, atmosphere oxygen. Uh yeah yeah actually it's uh, it's very nice today. The sunshine it's in the 60s and uh, uh, it's good it's good good stuff and yeah it's no no viruses running around at the moment. I'm just on a balcony with the dog. That's about it. Well, Chris, dogs, you, I don't know. They have viruses yeah. of their own. <laughs> you being in uh, in New York City, uh, just one of the media centers of the world, maybe maybe the biggest one. Uh, you, of course, we're both radio engineers. We take care of broadcast facilities. You do a lot of television work on the side. A lot of it is uh, te- video for radio purposes or kind of an adjunct to what a, broad, a radio broadcaster is doing. But you've also been involved, certainly, in television, uh, real television audio, Probably much more than I have, but you know our guest. Uh, we had him on before, and uh, we'll 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 meet him in just a second. But our our guest coming up has a lot of things to say about television audio. We'll uh, we'll we'll introduce Rob Ashard in just a minute. But uh, Chris, I, I know that you and Rob will have plenty to to talk about. Before we get to Rob, I want to uh, mention the the fact that Nautel wants you to check out the newest ebook from Radio World. You can learn how radio stations can ensure their RF chains are ready for anything in the latest Nautel-sponsored Radio World ebook. It's called Plan B, Ensuring RF Readiness. Now, Chris Alexander is an author in there. He writes about major systems to consider from your STL to even your key personnel. Buck Fitch reflects on site hardening and keeping the generator fit. Ed Lobnitz shares resources for lightning protection. And engineers like Robbie Green of Entercom, Larry Wilkins of the Alabama Broadcasters Association, Michael LeClaire of WBUR, and Doug Irwin of iHeartMedia, all of these guys share tips as do experts from several leading technology manufacturers. Now, this ebook and many others can be found 
at Nautel.com. Go to Nautel.com, down click on the resources button, and then look for ebooks. And then you can see the Plan B ebook. And in fact, you can see um, a listing of all of their ebooks because they're all there for you to en enjoy and learn from. So check those out at Nautel.com and then click on resources and ebooks. And uh, that's a great, uh, great service. I love that Nautel makes so much information available. Um, even articles that may be written about a competitor. It's all great information. And by the way, if you've never read it, one of the finest uh, books about transmitter site uh, building and, and, and wiring that I've ever read uh, was by Nautel about lightning protection for uh, RF for transmitter sites. It, it's available from Nautel. It's in the back of some of their manuals. It's uh, just a great uh, appendix or addendum to the manual, and you will learn so much. Before you design a transmitter site, Read that from Nautel because it'll it'll tell you how to do it right. All right, Chris, um, let's bring in Rob Ashford from uh, from the UK, from Britain. Rob, I always get confused. Do I say England, Britain, UK? Where, where, where are you at, sir? I'm in the, I'm in England, which is in the UK. Yeah. Okay. But there are places that are in the UK that are not in England, right? Yes, uh, Scotland and <laughs> Wales and Northern Ireland. Ah, uh, okay. And You're testing my Britain? biography now. <laughs> what about Britain? When do I when do I say Britain? Come on, I haven't I haven't come on here for questions about geography. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, we'll ask you about the geography of an audio console. Rob, uh, you were on here before about Radio Caroline, and we're going to do a little update, a little couple of pictures from Radio Caroline. But you've got something, mm -hmm. several things to talk about that have to do with television audio in this time of the coronavirus, and some amazing mm -hmm. well tips and tricks. Give us a little kind of wet our whistle yeah. for what we're going to be hearing about. Well, one of the things we've done just recently is a uh, live show um, that goes out on Channel 4 uh, here in the UK. Um, and it uh, has three hosts. Uh, one of them's in Melbourne. Uh, they're normally in the studio with an audience. Um, uh, but on this occasion, one of them's in Melbourne, one of them's in uh, Huddersfield in north of England, and one of them's in East London. Uh, and they're on live view cameras, and we're going to talk about uh, how we get them talking. Of course, with comedy, any delay in the audio is, is catastrophic, really, for com comic timing. So uh, we'll be discussing how, we, how we've got that a little bit faster so that the, the banter can be a little more fluid. You're so right, because there's, there's, no, there's nothing like... Well, because it happens all the time. The anchors uh, in a in a news show, the anchor saying, "Let's go to Sharon, who's out at the scene of the accident," and they cut to Sharon. And she's going, <laughs> "Thanks, Bob. It's really terrible out here." It's uh, and Rob Rob Asher, our guest, has hacked his way around that problem. It's pretty cool uh, in in a, in a comedy sense too, not in a tragic accident. So, hey, this show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by my friends at Angry Audio. Don't get angry. Uh, don't wait, don't wait, don't get, don't get mad, get angry, do get angry. This is, this is the coolest thing. If you are broadcasting from home or a small studio, and maybe you don't have your regular telephone hybrid with you, but you need to put telephone audio on, this is the key right here. And this thing costs a lot less than you think it would. Call your favorite dealer and ask about the Angry Audio Bluetooth gadget. The Bluetooth gadget. You pair it with your phone. There's even a button right here. Bluetooth pairing. Eek, just click that over. It's a, it's a, uh, little spring loaded button and it's just awesome. You can pair it or reset it and pair it with your phone, connect it up to your little audio console. It's got, it's got uh, AES output. Plus it's got analog inputs and outputs right there on the back. And then you can pair it with your phone. And whenever you make a phone call, you can tell your phone, Hey, put the audio out, make the audio I O in and out go through the Bluetooth gadget. And that makes it come through your little home audio console. Doesn't matter if you've got a Behringer console or if you've got a, a Mackie console or if you've got some big fancy console at home like Rob Ashard does. It doesn't matter. Your telephone audio will come through with the highest possible quality right into your audio console. And your mix minus audio being fed back to the caller sounds great too. This is just a terrific way to get yourself a telephone hybrid-like device right there at your home studio. You can, of course, you can use it in your regular broadcast facility too. If you need to add the ability to, let's say you've got disc jockeys that come in and they want to play music from their phone or from their iPad um, or other you know device that's Bluetooth equipped into the audio console, no problem. The Bluetooth device will handle that. You don't have to worry about connecting and unconnecting. And what do you do about a lightning connector for phones that, that don't have an, a TRS jack? 
this handles it all because all these phones nowadays have Bluetooth. And this thing, the Bluetooth gadget, even figures out which Bluetooth mode to use for the best quality. Check it out at angryaudio.com and call your favorite dealer. Say, I want this thing from Angry Audio, the Bluetooth audio gadget. And by the way, while you're on the phone, you know, Studio Hub is not dead. Studio Hub is alive. All these connectors that go into RJ45s. And when you order any of these that have the female RJ45, you just ask your dealer, hey, I want, I want my free cable. You get a free seven foot shielded Cat5 cable with every, uh, with every Studio Hub uh, cable adapter that you buy. Doesn't matter if it's the quarter inch tip ring sleeve or male or female XLRs. You know, you got all these things available to you. Ask for your free, your free seven foot Cat5 cable. Just ask for it. They have to give it to you. They have to. All right. It's this week in Radio Tech, episode 493. I'm Kirk along with Chris Tobin and our guest, Rob Asher. Rob, let's kick this thing off. You've got so much to say and, and some pictures too. So I don't know where you, I don't know where you want to start. You start with whatever you're comfortable with and, and tell us, well, some, let's tell just us some tales. Start, let's just start with the TV center picture, just to put you literally in the picture, um, to show you where I was working, uh, on Friday and, uh, we'll be working, uh, for the next three Fridays. There we go. So that's, uh, uh no, it was the first one of those two. Um, first one. Now, that's let's take a the look at that one. Studio, Studio Vista 10 console uh, in t TC1. So there are three studios uh, in Television Center. And uh, we're in, in one. Do, I do quite a lot of shows there. Um, you may or may not have seen in America, uh, on BBC America, um, the Graham Norton show. And I do that show there, which is uh, kind of worldwide viewed show. Oh. So it's uh, if, the if there's a show, <laughs> we're, we're running through them there. Uh, if there's a show that you you might know that I do, it's it's that one. Anyway, I've certainly so heard of Graham. So you, so you do the audio on you do the audio on Graham Norton, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's wow. uh, that's a big chat show. We have a lot of big um, international film guests. Uh, Tom Cruise has been on a number of times. Matt Damon uh, actually said this is the most fun I've ever had on chat show when he was on. <laughs> um, Meryl Streep, I think, said uh, that oh, he she said to somebody, uh, Graham's the best uh, chat show host in the world. He's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. Very funny guy. Um, he just just gets the best out of the uh, the guests on the show. And we have some live music on as well. So I get to, to mix some live bands, which is nice and, and really quite rare these days to, to be Rob, able to get I, your hands I, on a I appreciate full, it. We, 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 got the, we finally got the picture there on. Are you in that red room with that, that console? That's a television center. I, I wonder if yes. you could, um, uh, if we could get that picture up just a bit more. I, we're, I'm a radio guy. Now, Chris Tobin may have been around consoles like this. I've been around some recording studio consoles. But if we could leave this picture up for a minute, and uh, Rob, if you would just give us a little tour as to what we're looking at and the capabilities. Why do you need so many faders and buttons? I mean, radio stations don't really need this. What's going on in this room? Well, we have um, we have so many inputs uh, on a show. There's a, a, a big Saturday night um entertainment show I was doing. I think we had 14 radio mics. We had, uh, ooh, crumbs, probably about um, 10 hand radio mics. Uh, so you you need, <laughs> you need a lot of those faders. And in fact, I'm sometimes using more layers because you can't have everything up that you want at any one time. So sometimes we're flicking between layers to get access another 10. So you can switch each of those banks of 10 faders you can uh, step down six layers of, of faders. I mean, I only usually use a couple, to be fair. Um, but also buried down things like we have about 16 audience mics, so they'll be way down at the bottom because you don't need to, to, to access the, the audience mics. They're all up and they come up on a single fader, which incidentally, a lot of people never realize this until they see me mixing a show. I remember a camera guy coming in once and he said, I can't believe you you're moving all the faders all the time. I think a lot of people think, you know, on a quiz show, you've got your, all your people on, on one set of faders and you leave them up and the audience, you just leave that fader up. But absolutely not. Um, before we had the benefits of things like auto mix, uh, which has made life a lot easier, um, you would actually be pushing only about an inch or so. But, but bear in mind that the difference, the challenges that we have compared to radio is that, all this chat, every, pretty much every show I do has an audience, which means that it's all on a PA system. 
So everybody is wearing a personal mic and the, the microphones are omnidirectional. So they're picking up the PA spill. So somebody once said that mixing television light entertainment is actually balancing spill because you have to kind of make it consistent. So if you've got a part of the show where you can actually make it much drier, you tend to find yourself pushing the audience fader up to just keep that spill level the same. Otherwise, it suddenly sounds different. So, um, yeah, so so we've got a lot of sources. And uh, as I say, a lot of those are personal, what we call personal mics, clip mics, uh, whatever you call them with a radio pack. And uh, they're omnidirectional. So, yeah, you get... Um, you get spill off the PA. Sometimes you also have to set up foldbacks. So if you've got a wide set and you've got some people one side and some the other, like panel shows where you've got a, a, someone running the show in the middle and you've got a panel either side, you quite often have a speaker behind them with the other panel on it so they can ah. what we call cross fold back cross fold back so um, so they can hear each other and we actually put the speakers behind them so that you can have it quite a good level but their bodies shield the spill of the oh. fold back onto yeah. their personal so that 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 works really well and obviously it's, wow. it's out of shot as well if it's behind you, but, uh, yeah. you mentioned two two things that i'd never would have thought of, of on, on live television shows first of all that those foldback speakers uh for panelists on different sides because they, they can't hear each other well across mm -hmm. a, a large stage with a, a studio audience and so the, and so do you actually mix that those monitor speakers yourself or is that another yes, person i job? tend Different people do different different ways. I actually, uh, maybe I'm a control freak, but I tend to drive everything. So even on the Norton <laughs> show, even with a live band, I I drive the PA as well. But I drive drive the PA off uh, stems of the band. So I've got a drum stem and a band minus drum stem and a backing vocal stem and a vocal stem. Um, particularly when you're talking about chat. I mean, sometimes when you do a bigger show, you would uh, you would mixer in if you're doing a music special um you would tend to have a pa mixer in um but when you're mixing the personals if you have someone on a pa desk mixing them and a lot of pa guys are going to hate to hear this it, if they're doing it very slightly different to you what happens is at home you hear the different spill levels because if they're just kind of half an inch higher on their fader that relatively than i was or they have a different trim of gain in their channels. Um, you, you'll find some some people's lines are a bit tight and dry, and others have got more PA spill on them. If if I drive the PA, the PA is is proportional to what I'm doing, so that spill stays consistent. Um, and and also it, on a lot of shows, once you've got it all going it's actually surprisingly static in terms of the setup and it just follows you what what you're doing it has to yeah what about what about the uh the actual house pa mix is that you doing that or is that yet another person mixing that for house no that's what i was saying on, on a lot of the oh. time the house pa is driven by an aux off my desk so so my desk okay. in that okay. situation quite often is is producing the mix you hear at home it's producing a PA mix. It's producing foldback mixes. It's producing standing feeds for presenters in their ears. It's producing yeah, mix yeah. minuses for incoming sources. So there's a huge okay. amount of stuff going on on that mixer at times. Now, see, that's so different because now, again, my experience is somewhat limited, but uh, here in Nashville, Tennessee, we have the Grand Ole Opry, which I think is pretty typical of a big music venue. And you you have three actual mixers. One is for broadcast, and they actually do use the same mix for television and for WSM radio. But then mm -hmm. they have a house mixer, and he's outside the sound booth. He's in the audience at the back of the audience. And then you have a monitor mixer that's on stage off in, in the wings. And you're telling me that you do the same job as these three people no i don't do oh. i i wouldn't do the monitor mix no no oh. no no Okay. Okay. That's, <laughs> no, that's a different. You've thing. got to have a guy down there talking to the artists, All dealing right. with them, one hundred percent. And actually, a lot of got the it. time, if you're doing a big music special, I would also have a PA mixer. But we've got sort of the, we've got a very slick operation um, with with that show in terms of how we how it's done, um, and uh, the workflow has really become quite quite slick. Um, my mixer has. 
uh, channels that are effectively template channels. So the, the, the channels I always use for drums, I've got a very good starting point, for instance, for my kick in and my kick out, my snare top, my snare bottom. So we can hit the ground running pretty quickly. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's how it works. Now, but Chris yes, on a bigger I, show, I would have a PA mixer. I think Chris and I have probably talked about this a, a time or two, and that is you mentioned this notion of different layers on your console, and you said that has about mm -hmm. six layers. You typically might only use two of them, and and at some layer, you're going to kind of pre-make a mix, and then that mix is going to come up on a fader that's on your top layer. And this is a, a new concept for me because I've, I don't – most radio consoles don't have layers, although uh, my employer, Telos Alliance, now makes a radio console – that's also used for television called the Quasar, and it has layers in it. Now, to me, oh, my God, that would just be totally confusing. Uh, could you tell us a bit about mixing with layers and mentally how you how you put things in the in the right layer so you have the access to it at the level that you need? At layers, it's a level of versatility, and with versatility comes danger, as you can imagine, as, as, as I can tell that you're, you're, <laughs> you're seeing the potential for disaster. So, yeah, you've really got to be careful. Um, we've all made mistakes with layers, um, thinking that you're on one layer and you're on another and you fade something up, and you think, well, why isn't that there? And you suddenly, it's not that at all that you're trying to fade up. So you really have to come up with... Um, a setup where your crucial stuff never changes. Uh, you know, you would never, you would never have a host mic that becomes something else. It's too crucial. So, planning your desk layouts are, 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 are quite crucial in that respect because you've got to make it as. as I always let's say, doing TV audio, you have to give the minimum chance of you making a mistake. Someone's. Um, I looked at pictures I've put up of the, the the desks I use, and I actually have white tape, even though you can electronically label all the inputs. For the hosts, I have white tape at the top, and the main host I, hosts or hosts I have in red, and then the others are in black, And so that if I suddenly find I've got to jump in when I didn't expect to, my hands just go straight to it. So you've got to do make, make the job as watertight as you possibly can. Um, so yes, you only put things on layers that, and you'll put a big note in your script. Writing your script is crucial. You have to write your script like if you drop down dead in dinner break, someone could sit down and mix the show and l look at your script and go, oh, layer three, faders 30 to 40. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, you've just got yeah. to make life clear for yourself, especially in, in, in something like that. You, you, you've just got to give yourself a big red note, you know, PTO layer three. <laughs> That's all, all right. Help, help, help dispel a, a miss or a concept that I have. I've heard that in, in England, your, your radio consoles or maybe all mixing consoles are intended to be run with the faders all the way up. And you only pull them down and you and you put them all the way up and then you set the trim so that all the way up is the right level. And that's a little foreign yeah. to radio broadcasters in the US. And does that concept apply over to your television mixing or are you sitting at a zero point with, you know, t 10 dB extra to go if you want it? No, zero point for a TV, and I would trim the gain mm. so that I on all the guests, so that I know that if I faded up to zero, the gain will be about right for that person. Uh, the, historically, for the radio thing, bear in mind we didn't have um, commercial radio here until '74, right? So really late in the day, we, uh, commercial radio legally. We had uh, the offshore stations happened in the '60s. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, what happened in, when radio started in 74 uh, under the control of the IBA, one of the things that they decreed was that the FM band was a pristine hi-fi medium and they didn't want you to have uh, processing. So you had a, um, a limiter in the racks room and I remember in my local station they had a little clicker that clicked over every time you peaked, you've probably seen our uh, PPM meters, which are black, um, black meters with a white scale. So six mm -hmm. is plus eight. And that's, that's where, that's where you should peak to and, and thou shalt not uh, pass uh, that point. So 
this little counter counted up every time it went over, it flashed a red light and counted over, uh, if you peaked over six, well, this thing went round over a hundred all, <laughs> all day long because, <laughs> but we, so, um, yeah, the IBA didn't want you to have, uh, processing. So what, what actually happened when you queued up a record in, uh, in the early seventies and mid seventies, you would, uh, press the piffle button, drop the needle on the track and set the gain to be correct, which then meant that when you opened the fader, which quite often uh, we had a lot, fader start was quite popular uh, mm -hmm. here. So you just whack the fader all the way up to the top and it would be, it would on the noisy bit of the record, it would be the, about the right level. So that's how that came about. And we never really use the uh, processing as creatively as Americans do. You know, I've seen, watched, watched your uh, off air, your, you know, your air check videos where the faders are all about halfway up, aren't they? And they're really pushing in and knocking a song out of the way with, a, with an incoming one, you know, all that sort of stuff. Ah. That doesn't really happen here and, because we've never had that culture. We didn't really get processing, I don't think, until the 80s. There were stories of radio stations putting Optimods under the floorboards. <laughs> because it was illegal to have them. <laughs> so, so if the IBA turned up, they wouldn't find them. Hey, so in, in, in just a sec, we're going to look at the, at the Game Creek uh, truck uh, picture. But just before Ooh. we do, see, me growing up in, in radio, I know, when I was a disc jockey, we had so many songs, or at least a number of them, that started out low, very quiet. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, if, if you just played that with the processing that we had at the time, that wouldn't that may or may not have sucked it up um you would end up playing and people would wonder is is, is there anything on the radio do i need to turn that up because if the <laughs> intro was quiet so that's why i always appreciated having a good 10 db of gain left on my fader whether it was a rotary mm. fader or a, or a linear fader I, there was plenty of songs we had to pot it way up at the beginning and then bring it back down when they when the song really mm -hmm. kicked in right uh and then we would of course we do a lot of talk over but um yeah i i was that's why i always wondered how would you get by with setting the fader all the way up with no more gain available mm -hmm. for the loudest part of the song um when there may be plenty of the song that needs an extra 10 db of of, of gain in, to make your meters yeah, wiggle now, but maybe for, yeah, it yeah exactly <laughs> it was quiet so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, That's uh, how it was. Uh, so Chris has been in some, in some OB trucks, and Chris, we're going to show this one from a place called Game Creek OB truck with a Calrec console. Uh, if we can look at that picture, and Rob, you can you can tell us about that. So this was um, uh, we we refer to these things as OBs, which is an outside broadcast. You call them a remote. Um, so this is one we did. Uh, there's a big uh, Saturday night uh, show that I did for ITV. Um, something like nine million viewers on a Saturday night, huge. And the the, the guys that uh, present it and deck are just massively famous. Probably the biggest pre TV presenters in the in the country. Um, and they uh, did a series of. Uh, shows and what did we do seven shows in the studio and um and then they actually give away uh places on the plane to people involved in the show and so members of the audience basically and uh so then they literally took a plane load of people and we did a show at universal studios so that's uh the console i was at that's a fabulous uh, uh calrec apollo uh, probably the biggest calrec apollo i've ever sat at fantastic thing and the game creek trucks were absolutely awesome um so yeah that's uh, at the time i was working at a studio unfortunately is now closed i i worked at um what became the itv studios on the south bank of the thames in london um it, i started there in 1980 when it was called london weekend television and i was a trainee and did booms and uh, rig mics and operated Fisher booms on dramas and sitcoms. Uh, we did big light entertainment shows, but we also had a fleet of OB trucks and did sport. Um, and latterly, we had uh, Calrec desks, and uh, we ended up with a, with an Apollo in our studio one. So I was very um, pleased. I was able to set that desk up exactly as I had the one at <laughs> back at South Bank. So I felt very at home with the layout and how it was working. So uh, I was able to sort of plan it all ahead, how I would do it. So yeah, it's, uh, it was, it was a great truck and a very successful, a very successful job. Did, did that console have a, a row of 
faders near you and then another another row just beyond yes, reach now, funnily, f- funnily enough that was the th- one thing that threw me because uh the, the carex have an a b layer so they have 12 a b layers so you actually have two really accessible layers at your beck and call um right in front of you so um because the big faders are below the row of uh, there's a row of two buttons the a and b buttons um mm, yeah like, oh, it's difficult to see there um and yes there is another little you can see a little row of uh small faders above now because they were above they were connected to the a button and the big faders were connected to the b button whereas i was used we, our desk didn't have the little row so our big faders were on the a layer <laughs> so that was the only thing just took luckily we rigged i think on the tuesday and we did the show on the uh, saturday oh no we sorry we rigged the show wednesday thursday and rehearsed sort of thursday friday and, and did it on saturday so by then i was sort of used to it um i mean talking about getting used to faders one of the things that uh we a lot of us over here have to do is work on BBC mixers, older mixers, where the faders actually work in the opposite direction, and uh, that's a painful learning curve, I can tell you. That's going to be there amazing to talk about. <laughs> when when we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I do want to hear about these backwards faders from the BBC, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Radio Caroline and wrap things up uh, talking about uh, this in- enormous SSL console and some other ones, and this this concept uh, called D rig. I'm not sure what that means, but mm. uh, we're going to hear about that. Oh, well, we hey, must it's those. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, we talk. must talk about that early feedback of uh, Mix Minus thing as well. We oh, were going to talk oh about. Of, of course, we promoted that. So, yeah, we've got to know about yeah, yeah, how, yeah. To, how to hack, how to yeah. hack live view. Uh, yeah, we, we will do that, too. <laughs> All right. You're watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode 493. I'm Kirk Harnack. Chris Tobin is along. He's being real quiet, but uh, it, that's OK. He is uh, he's he's hanging out uh, high above the uh, street level in New York City. I hear I'm Chris enjoying there. it. Chris? Me. I'm enjoying it. It's, it's well, you good be, stuff. You, you be sure and, and, and just jump in if, if you like. Right now, though, we're going to talk about uh, Broadcaster General Store and uh, the fact that BGS represents so many broadcast companies. By the way, not just radio equipment. They also have a fair amount of television production equipment, things that are useful for your home or small studio or even big studio television productions. But right now, we want to hear about uh, the Innovonics, uh, Aaron 655. We'll be right back. Hang on. The Aaron 655 is the latest addition to the Innovonics family of rebroadcast receivers, designed specifically for FM broadcast translators, also referred to as relay transmitters. The Aaron 655 is unique as an uncompromising DSP-based HD radio and FM receiver combined with a powerful three-band audio processor and dynamic RDS encoder. IP connectivity adds streaming capabilities and a web browser interface gives you total remote control of the unit from any PC or mobile device. The Aaron 655 gives you maximum flexibility for program sources. Select program audio from analog FM, digital channels HD1 through 8, streaming sources, and analog or AES digital line inputs, all with assignable failover audio backup. The internal RDS encoder allows you to customize your RDS messaging. You can use incoming off-air RDS data, convert HD radio pad data to RDS, convert streamed metadata to RDS, or receive IP telnet data. Comprehensive audio processing includes gated and windowed AGC, a unique syllabic leveler, three bands of compression, and both wideband and independent HF limiting. Easy setup is achieved by using 10 factory presets and 10 customizable presets. The processor also supports day parting, allowing automatic preset changes to follow different programming formats throughout your broadcast day. The front panel has an OLED display and jog wheel with intuitive menus for easy setup, advanced control, and editing for all operating parameters. The Aaron 655 Dynamic Web Interface gives you total remote control of the unit, from any PC or mobile device. A comprehensive set of menus includes a quick overview of now playing info, input-output control, processor options, RDS encoder, alarms and notifications, SNMP settings, and much more. 
You can also listen to the live audio broadcast streamed through the web interface. Check out the uh, Innovonics Aaron 655 at InnovonicsBroadcast.com or go to the BGS website because they will uh, be able to get you one and get you a good price on one too at BGS.cc, BGS.cc. Or call them. I got the number memorized. <laughs> call me and I'll tell, tell you what it is. 352-622-7700. They're open. They're open for business and they're shipping at Broadcasters General Store. By the way, I got to mention, if you haven't been to the Innovonics website, InnovonicsBroadcast.com, uh, it's really cool because you can online, you can try out the web interface for any of their products that have web interfaces. It's a really good online demo, and uh, you're going to like it. You can try before you buy, so to speak, get a feel for what a product can do. Thanks a lot to BGS and to um, uh, Innovonics for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, it's Kirk along with Chris Tobin, and we're talking with Rob Asher. He's the uh, the A1 Super Duper TV audio go-to guy uh, in, in England. And uh, Rob, we're going to uh, talk for a minute about Radio Caroline, look at a couple pictures, and then get to your hack of live view. <laughs> so let's let's check in about Radio Caroline, where you came to us from on the, the last time you were on the show. Yeah, we were live to you from the Ross Revenge very late at night. I should say uh, you had a, you were talking about it being a sunny day, uh, not sunny here, of course, because it's uh, twenty two forty at night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, I see it's dark outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah, and thank so you for clarifying we, that because I, I say Radio Caroline and I think of the ship, but you clarify. You said yes, we were coming to you from the Ross Revenge, the the ship that we associate with with Radio Caroline. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, but uh, most of the time uh, we broadcast from Land Studios. And, and in fact, of course, with all this uh, madness going on, uh, lots of us are broadcasting from home. In fact, I, I'll just very quickly, if you can call up the home studio, you can see where I'm sitting now. And, ah, the home uh, studio pick, yes. I don't know if Sandcast can do that home studio picture and anyway so i'm doing uh, i'm doing I, I as well as doing engineering for caroline i do occasional shows so i'm just uh, doing monday nights at the moment because the guy uh, who normally does monday nights is uh, can't get to the studio and doesn't have his own studio so uh, i'm doing monday nights seven till nine uh, uk time uh, with what that kind of a uh, rack lash out there yeah what kind of rack mount console is that it's a uh, soundcraft it came out of an edit suite i believe um and i bought it because it's got uh four um four mono mic channels on the left or mono mic line and then it's got right. eight stereo line channels but it's got some quite clever monitoring on it as well so i can actually if i want to put a like a processor back in to listen on my cans i can hear that uh, it's got a couple of auxes um that you can set to post fade and i've done situations where i've um had two mix minuses going out of it to uh, a, a messenger call and a phone call, uh, not for Caroline, actually, for another project I did. Um, and it's just a very flexible little mixer, uh, which I've had for years, but it's just a brilliant little rock solid thing called a G Soundcraft GP1. Um, and I've just modified it. I've just put some uh, micro switches in the first two faders. So the, the speakers mute when you fade the mic mics up, but that's that's about it. Otherwise, it's pretty much as it, as it arrived. But yeah, it's... Uh, it's a great little mixer and does the trick. And, and up on the in the rack, I've got uh, the top of the rack is the mic processor that you're listening to now, which is a TC uh, gold channel mic channel. So it's a little bit of compression and EQ on that. Okay. Um, and there in the it, also in the rack is a, an Orion. That's an interesting box actually. It's a 32 IO analog IO uh, USB two sound device, but it's also wow. got ADAT on it. And it's got huh. Maddie on it. Um, yeah, it's 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 pretty pretty clever, uh, pretty clever device. And at the bottom is just my uh, Mo Two Eight Two Eight Mark Two. So my audio play play out comes out of that onto three faders of the mixer. So that's what that is. There, and I even play a little bit of vinyl every now and then. I see. I see. Are, are you speaking through that little <laughs> console now, or are you more directly connected to the? To your computer no i'm uh, speaking through it uh now yeah it's just actually you're hearing it via an aux um one of the auxes um so the the process the mic processor is is ahead of it so the mic goes ah, straight into the processor yeah. comes up on that first channel uh and then it's actually going out to you <laughs> effectively on a mix minus out of the console into my mac air via the What's um th via the orion you you have a picture of a processing rack for Radio Caroline. It's got a, several interesting mm. processors in it, including yeah, a TV so, processor that um, you said is 
being put into some other duty. Let's take a look at that. There we go. Yes, it's just the, t- the, the old Optimod TV. First gorgeous little box that thing uh it's actually just doing a little bit of um phase rotating um for asymmetric voices uh but we've got a dspx uh hd mini mini hd i think it's called is the is what processes our stream um at the lower down my tcdb max was uh leveling out the feed that goes to the am uh, transmitter uh which is in the east of england we've got a one kilowatt um it's actually uh, Ofcom licensed uh, as a community station, uh, mm-hmm. so it's limited to one kilowatt. But it's a it's a very good kilowatt. It does, does get out very well. Um, and then below that uh, is a DAB um, processor for the London DAB. So we've got quite a few DAB outlets across the country. Most of them are fed from the DSPX Mini, uh, but the London um, the London processing is done on the on the green one at the bottom, which is supplied by the people that uh, that have, uh, provide the DAB facility. So uh, yeah, quite a good little setup. And then if we can go back to the uh, the uh, Caroline Studio, I don't know if we, if that's possible. There we go. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. So that's uh, an Alice Air two thousand. It's kind of, I guess, it's the equivalent of your kind of Pacific Recorders type uh, console. Uh, mm-hmm. It was absolutely massively popular in the 90s and noughties um, in uh, ILR, in, in independent local radio here. It's, it's yeah. built like a tank. It's a totally analog desk, uh, but VCA faders. Um, it was struggling a bit. The uh, the input AB selector switches um, were struggling, and then I discovered Deoxit D5 <laughs> and it uh, breathed, a, <laughs> breathed a bit of life into those so uh yeah and we've got some cd players and everything's remote start so uh we've got bcx play out which is fabulous we've had we've had bcx for a long time now um and that has four players you can see the four players along the top and uh i actually made the interface it's um uh, it's a five pound uh usb keyboard ripped apart and the those players respond to f5 six seven and eight so i traced back um those f keys to the usb process you, you know the um, chip and uh, yeah. they're remoted out the to the back of the console so when you press the buttons on the channels the those players start so uh yeah little wow little pretty, pretty clever hack yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 oh and there's that i will <sighs> just mention sorry can we just go back this is yeah, yeah. really neat go back. the speaker on the right the speaker on the left is actually sitting on the rack but the speaker on the right that is a bit of standard rainwater gutter pipe <laughs> and i took the drive unit out and there's a bit of length of threaded studding that goes and holds it but it's really solid and and it, i think it looks really neat i hate seeing speakers down on the desk because they sound awful yeah. when they're down yeah. on the worktop i like them at air height and i think as a presenter you want to enjoy the music as you're listening to it so i like to have the speakers you know right there and it, it, they sound great they're just little wharfdale diamonds i think um, so yeah, this is a really nice studio to use. Really nice studio to use. That is beautiful. That, and and where is that one located? <laughs> That's about twenty minutes from me in Kent, here in the okay the southeast of England. <clears throat> so that one's not on the Ross Revenge. No, there's a smaller version on the Ross Revenge. Is a, a, ah. a, an area. Oh, I don't know if you noticed on that. It, it often causes uh, great hilarity amongst American uh, people that see it. That we have this script area. We call it a script area. You call it a copy right. area. So right. that that central area is designed to just put your bits of paper in and read. And obviously, it now ends up with a little keyboard in it as well. So the one we've got is a much smaller frame, no script area, and it's about I don't know twelve channels or something. Uh, so yeah, it's, but it's exactly the same channels, exactly the same mixer, just much smaller on the ship. I'm, I'm recalling uh, some consoles that Chris Tobin uh, put into a, a news talk radio station. Uh, Chris, did, did did you put some consoles in that had a had a script area in the middle? Uh, yes, our, our the Ward Bex did the early models, then the Axia consoles that we purchased. Uh, yes, we put the script in. That was that was intentional. It was split in half. It was. Uh, Basically, believe it or not, the news operation back in the early days, in the late uh, 80s, uh, they had copied uh, or had, I guess, basically saw what the BBC was doing and said, you know what, we could do this for the news copy. And that's what they did. And we kept it all the way through. Matter of fact, it's still that way today in the new facility. And doesn't that area also get used for a, a, uh, a custom or a small keyboard? Doesn't that fit in there? 
Well, yes, we did uh, in the new generation. It was the first time we first in, uh, bought the Axia stuff. Yes, hmm. we did make it so that it could accommodate a keyboard and an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper, A4. Right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, it yeah. worked out very well, and it was very convenient. Right. A lot of people would come through the studio and laugh, They're like, "What's the point of that?" And the news anchors would just get very terse. <laughs> oh, very it's like you have no idea what it what it's to do is trying to read the news news segments looking uh, up at two different computer screens and trying to keep your copy in order so get out i mean it was fun <laughs> watching the anchors just yeah, tell people off it was, it was good chris uh, i know being in, in new york city plenty of television stations there use these uh, these remote uh uh data systems for cameras and, and mics for doing live remote broadcasts or OBs and they use the bonded cellular so they, they pick a bunch of cellular channels from different carriers so they're always likely to have some good coverage and they add these data rates together and make an aggregate pipe that's big enough to carry hopefully some good HD quality video and uh, one of the most popular brands is live view they pretty well have the the market cornered as far as I can tell I see them at lots of TV stations you, you have plenty of those right Chris yes actually I walk past two OB vans uh, every day on my way to work and they have live view of uh, the external antenna array the box on the top of the truck but yes, oh, yeah. yes live view is definitely a uh, very popular uh, lots of delay because I know a friend of mine that works at one of the major news networks their biggest complaint is the delay and they've been working on solutions around that but uh yeah that's it's a hard one you're right. You know, let's throw it to the OB site and wait a few seconds, wait a few seconds, wait for it. Wait, there they go. Yes, yes it's always fun. Because <laughs> that delay of the reporters starting their report, that's that's the round trip delay. That's getting that's getting the tail end of the intro to the reporter, the reporter hearing it and starting back. And then you got the delay coming back. So you're hearing the entire or you're seeing or observing or experiencing the entire round trip delay. And it's not just a round trip delay. There's there's computers that are, you know, muxing these different uh, data change together and you got to take care of the slowest one you can't go any faster than the slowest one so rob ashard uh recognized this problem with a particular television show and it wasn't a news show it was comedy and you know with comedy mm. rob you told me and it's true timing is absolutely everything you can't have pregnant <laughs> pauses the audience will slip away from you just like water through your fingers and it won't be funny and so so rob Tell us the story of what you had to figure out and what you did. Well, I certainly won't take the credit for it because uh, it actually Tim Wood, uh, who's the engineering manager on the show, had uh, already put a lot of this in place. Um, and uh, also, I will just mention um, Andy Tapley, who did that fantastic installation, had had created a basic uh, setup for the mixer because other shows have to coexist in uh, TC1. So he wanted us all to use the framework of, of a mixer that he put in there, and then we kind of added our bits around it. Um, but but because for the daytime shows that go in there, they're also using Live View, they're also using Skype. So we have three Live View cameras um, and uh, up to three different Skypes coming in, but actually four for us. So we needed to have presenters. One presenter's in uh, Melbourne, one's in uh, Huddersfield in north of England, one is in uh, east of England, uh, east of East London, sorry. And... So what uh, Tim did was to cut down on some of that latency, he put TBUs uh, in the three locations and had analog TBUs uh, in the studio sending the mixed minuses to them to cut back on how long it took them to hear the questions or whatever now, they now were you, responding you, to. You've got to tell us what a TBU is. What's a TBU? Sorry, telephone balance unit, and you called it a, um, you did tell me, and I know the word. Hi what is it? Hybrid. 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 That's right. Yeah, so no, it's, we call it's them the, that it, as well. It, interfacing the phone line, two-wire yeah. circuit to a four-wire um, uh, audio in console. Analog terms. In and out. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, TBU yeah. Yeah. is a hybrid. All right. All right, we got that for the rest yeah. of the story. All right. Yeah, yeah. so um, then uh, we luckily had a... Um, a tech run of this because it's obviously we had to know it worked and we had tim had also set up that uh the main host in melbourne he had a split of his mic so we put into the the other two hosts ears his his tbu return that was about a half a second ahead of the live view 
So, um, and then we realized how well that worked. So the first week we did it on air, we actually had all three of them effectively having a telephone conversation. So there was pretty much no latency. So for the com comedic terms, it meant they could have a nice uh, snappy banter and it, and it, and it worked. Um, and then we, the, the viewer, me included, hear it all half a second later. Uh, so the, the, what I had to do with the mixer is instead of the faders being their audio, which under normal circumstances, you would have just had the live view camera as a fader, that their faders, each, each of those three had a fader that was a VCA, a DCA, because it's a digital desk. And that controlled the fader that had the TBU return on it going to the mix minuses and it had the uh, live view return on it that was going to air. And then again, for the other two, exactly the same. So the TBUs were only up going to their ears if I'd faded the, up the main fader. So it worked, it worked really well. But the funny thing that happened was that when we had a Skype guest, I'd fed the Skype mix minus straight off this, <laughs> this same feed. And um, you know when you actually you've guessed what the question's going to be and you jump in on the end of it. They were actually coming in before it had finished. So, <laughs> so I had to, had to change how the, the routing was done for the, uh, for the Skype uh, feeds. So the, the mic mm. minuses were then fed off the uh, live view returns and not off the DBU returns, and then it all worked perfectly. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's worked really well. But, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of routing going on in, in what is essentially a, a few faders. Rip, but, uh, yeah. That that is one of the downsides of of our long distance digital systems is they they do have delay, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know that's that's part of how we fit you know uh, so many different packets onto uh, onto a network. But sometimes some of them have to wait, and uh, it does it does take time, and uh, oftentimes it. it you know, we cut. We we have ways around these problems. Whether it's HD broadcasting in the U.S., uh, I'm sure. I'm sure DAB has has delay there. Well, in, you, if you're broadcasting live on a DAB station, you can't possibly listen off the air uh, to yourself well, while you're so. speaking. No. No. no, no, no. You just wow. listen off the back of the processor, I guess. And of course, right. Um, the processors for DAB because they don't have clippers in, they have feed forward, don't they? Generally, so that. They're about as they have about as much latency as you can cope with. I think um, they they have more latency than an old analog uh, FM processor. So um, right. yeah, it's because you need that uh, a little bit of delay to make the feed forward limiter work, don't you? In a in a DA because you don't want any clipping on a digital stream because that clogs up the codec, doesn't it? Right, right. But typically, with the, whether it's HD or perhaps DAB, I don't know. But with HD, you have so much redundancy in the transmitted uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, digital uh, data that you have to you have to have buffering, and you have that time diversity too. So if you're mm -hmm. if you're driving and you uh, experience some dropout of some digits, well, guess what? Those same digits will be fed uh, a second or two later, and so you'll end up getting them. In, and then the buffer has to put all that together. So yeah, you and to to yeah. get robustness, we end up having to give up immediacy, so we can actually yeah. send the data either twice or send yeah. forward error correction along with it. So yeah, but that's a, that's a great hack about the the live view to to mix mm. it phone calls, and even even if the phone calls are now handled by telcos as VoIP uh, circuits and they're digital, and there's a little bit of delay, there's not nearly as much delay as you have with live view or other similar type yeah. of systems that are aggregating yeah, a well, lot our, of data. Our live views, yeah, our live views were about half a second. Or f it was about a second round trip if you did the whole thing. And then that's painful, absolutely painful in comedy terms. So, uh, well, in any yeah. terms, frankly, for a proper conversation. But if you're trying to be funny, you know, these guys really have, they, they, their relationship is great <laughs> and the banter between them is fantastic. So that would have just slowed it up uh, hugely. So, yeah, it, it worked well, worked well. If, if there was that but kind of I delay, say, I, don't, I, I don't ahead, take the credit for it. <laughs> and of course, we've got delay here uh, because uh, we're far apart, and we're you and I and Chris we're all being mixed in the middle in New York City, so we have two round trip delays going on for each of us. So that that makes it makes it a little uh, and be terrible to tell a joke and wait and have nobody react to it at all, not even a <laughs> snicker, for a second or two, and then f you wonder, did my joke flop? Because your brain thinks that fast as a comedian telling telling jokes. 
Yeah, wow. they did a funny they did a funny ba- chat about that, saying, "Oh, it does feel like nobody's laughing," and then nobody's <laughs> laughing. If you know, it was, it was quite funny what they what they made of it. They're, they're very funny guys. So, uh, I will just also just give a name check to my uh, right hand people um, because I I use the same people. Uh, I always have Cliff in the control room with me, who who's the tape art and plays in all the stuff. Um, and obviously, we don't we don't have a studio at the moment. But I have a guy called Pete Holmes who runs my floor crews, and we have a lot of regular guys. And everybody um, I work with is just makes my life uh, a lot easier. So I hugely appreciate the people I actually work with. So uh, yeah, it's, it's like they are like a pair of comfy slippers. My crew. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rob, I realize we're we're running short on time. I wonder if yep. you could uh, pontificate for just a moment before we have to take our last break here. Talk about the production of shows with a studio audience and how you've mm-hmm. done a few shows now without a studio audience. What did you do to kind of compensate for that? What works and what just doesn't work anymore if you don't actually have live people? Well, we've had two situations. Uh, when we did um, the last uh, Anton Dex takeaway that we did, we didn't have an audience. And normally we have 500 people li- going nuts. Uh, there's a warm up guy who's just brilliant, and uh, the, the audience are just absolutely up for it. So, uh, on the last show we did without an audience, we got, I just put up a stereo pair of mics, and we had all the crew that weren't doing anything at any one time were told to stand over there and watch the monitor and react to the show. And that, do you know what? That just gave us a little bit of something which was nice. Um, but there are, you know, a lot of shows that we, we, we simply aren't able to have audiences. And this is, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. And you just have to go with with what, what you've got. And, uh, you know, everyone's doing a good job. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I have to say I miss studio audiences. I think it's one of those things that people probably didn't realize how much they missed them until, until now. Wow. Yeah. Earlier, you referred to a, a term I've heard before, but it's it's interesting that it's really part of your world, and that is spill or spill audio. Mm. So that's that's spilling from the PA speakers for the audience's benefit uh, back into the talent microphones, right? That's what spill typically is. Yes. And the audience yeah. mics. That's why you have to ride the audience fader quite viciously, mm-hmm. because if you... You push it in uh, the way I do it. I tend to have a post um, post fader compressor, compressor, which is actually in, in Television Center is a lovely old Neve three three six zero nine. It's just a lovely squishy thing, and you push the audience into it, and it means you can be quite vicious with the fader, and it will stop it where it needs to, and it won't hit an end limiter and then duck the talent out, which is quite mm. critical. So it makes it easier to mix, but it also means that you can make the the, the smaller laughs a bit bigger. And it controls the bigger laughs as well. So, it, it, but 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 if you get caught, you you kind of tend to get into a rhythm with your right hand it, 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 that that is becomes second nature. It can almost be a background uh, thing in your brain uh, that where you you just ride that fader up for the last but you get the timing of how people are delivering and you've got to get it back down you never take it out because it will dry up horribly so yeah you, but you pull it back down but you've just got to get the timing because if you're fully up when they speak you then get this monster handful of massive pa spill if you're not careful we're talking to Rob Ashard. Yeah, he is the go-to A1 Super Duper TV audio guy. And also, uh, he's on the air on Radio Caroline in, uh, in England. And uh, we're going to come back with a tip. Chris will have a tip of the week for us. And maybe we can talk Rob Ashard into uh, giving us a tip of the week, maybe some technique that uh, he was wanting to keep a secret, but he cannot keep a secret any longer. <laughs> maybe some good advice for people who are new uh uh, A2 or, or A1 uh, audio guys uh, uh, or girls in uh, in television production. So that's coming up. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by this guy right here, the Max Connect Wireless. This is so cool. Now, yes, it's a, it's a data modem. It connects to 4G LTE wireless. But what's different about it and what only Max Connect Wireless can get done for you is this data is prioritized. You get your packets through before anybody else does. You have your own channels on the cellular network. You have your own part of the pipe back to the internet. And you're not dividing that time with a thousand or a hundred or a hundred thousand 
other users of that cell tower or of that fiber backbone. You have these packets to yourself. In fact, the only people who have a higher priority than you do when you're using MaxConnect Wireless would be first responders. And that's understandable, but your broadcast can get through. So whether you're doing an audio broadcast, say from a football game or a parade, uh, whatever things open back up, we get to go back out, be ready. And if you're doing broadcasting from home, you know, there's plenty of on-air talent who may live in areas that don't get good internet. Maybe all you've got is DSL level of service, and that's barely enough to get audio in, in two directions. Well, Max Connect Wireless will hook you up with fast data speeds and reliable. Every packet gets through. That's been our experience. Uh, uh, Chris Tobin is part of a, uh, of a broadcast that goes on. It's a video and audio broadcast uh, that goes on in New Jersey. And they use the Max Connect Wireless to get their audio and video data back and forth to the studio, to the internet service provider, and to their content distribution network. It works very reliably for them in a very, very challenging, tough environment. I've even used these when our internet's been down uh, at our studios and got terrifically reliable service from it. In fact, I just want to point out it's service that no one else can get, not even on your phone, because your phone's data is not prioritized. So do what so many other broadcasters in the U.S. and Canada are doing now. Get one of these perhaps for your transmitter site for a backup a path in case your main STL dies. Get one for your remote kit to go out on remote. If you've got people working from home and they don't have good internet, Max Connect Wireless will take care of it for you. Check it out on the web at Max Connect wireless.com. It's spelled funny. That's why we have a link for it in the show notes, or you can take a uh, note of it right now of how it's spelled. MaxConnectWireless.com. And they're, they're on T-Mobile, they're on AT&T, and they're on Verizon. So whatever carrier is good for your area, and you can get two. This one right here that I have is on AT&T and Verizon both. Thanks a lot, Josh Bone and Max Connect Wireless for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right. Um, Chris Tobin, Looking for a tip of the week. What's What's been happening in your life that you want to share uh, to others to make their lives easier? <laughs> make it easier. Well, I'll tell you, since we're all uh, working from uh, off-site locations, something to remind you about is, you know, if you're doing uh, VPN and, and remote login, if you will, and various types of uh, remote access for your systems, both in the studios and off-site of transmitter sites, uh, review your uh, login uh, information. Double-check passwords. Make sure nothing's expiring. Uh, I recently was checking some stuff that we've been doing, and uh, thankfully everything is up to date. But a friend of mine, he was uh, caught with his pants down, so to speak. Uh, they found out one of their remote login systems, the, uh, there was an expiration date on certain users. And, uh, they found out the hard way. So double-check these things, especially if you're using third-party uh, services, where you may not realize that there is an expiration because that's just their housekeeping procedures. So double-check that stuff. So anything off-site, even in, in you know studio stuff, Check your logins. Make sure everything is up to date because you may get caught one morning at 3 a.m. Get a phone call and someone says, I can't log in to do something. You're like, what? And you're scavenging around the dark looking for that password paperwork. <laughs> and I know you like to keep uh, on paper. Um, I'm also a fan of using uh, LastPass myself. Um, I, I pay for LastPass to get whatever extra level of service. And not only can it keep login user information uh it can generate passwords for you really complicated passwords so that you know uh they're not dictionary words certainly and you can also store other data in there it's all secure all encrypted not even LastPass can can decode it uh so you do have to remember your master password uh, but you can also uh create one-time passwords to get into your last pass if you need to but you can also store secure notes so if you need to store let's say for example uh, licenses for software that you have purchased. You want to keep that in a secure place that won't go away. And you can access from any browser as long as you know your password. You, I, I do that for uh, software that our radio stations use. I store the license codes for that software in LastPass. And that way I always have access to it if I need to reinstantiate, reinstate that, that software somewhere. So that's a uh, good advice, Chris. And passwords expiring. I've had that happen to me, and and yes, gone through a lot of trouble. And the the IT people say, "Oh, so you let your password expire again?" That's the third time, Kirk. Yeah. Stay on top of that, Rob. Rob Ashard, maybe you've got a tip of the week to leave our audience with. Yeah, I I've thought of something that I do uh, in the way I set my mics up uh, in a studio that I think um, I've heard situations where I think it would benefit a kind of zoo format 
um, situation uh, when you've got a lot of mics in a radio station. So what I do, bear in mind, I'm fighting all this PA spill on omnidirectional mics. Um, it's a very bad thing to use individual channel compressors because all the other mics that aren't being spoken on, have you, you've, you've got that idle game that you drive that individual compressor with listening to the spill if you like so what yeah. i tend to do is i have a i always go into group one and i have a compressor on there sort of three four to one and that's where i do the bulk of my chat compression but what i then do is on the individual channels i have a 10 to one compressor that that barely gets touched if they're talking like this but if they laugh or get animated the 10 to 1 kicks in so it protects the chat compressor now if you listen to a lot of these um zoo formats and they've got individual channel compressors when somebody shouts the weirdest thing is they suddenly sound all distant because you suddenly the person that's shouting their compressor has kicked in so the ratio of clean to spill uh -huh. has changed <laughs> completely so I'm just advocating if you've got, I think you can do virtual mix setups with the Axia, can't you? So you could create a chat group and then compress sure. that, but then sure. just use the individual channel compressors that you can do on an Axia and many of these other uh, new consoles. So yeah, just, just, just have a think about experimenting with that. So just have what I call a channel catcher at 10 to one that really isn't, that is protecting the chat compressor. The, the other reason for protecting it is if you shout, you'll duck everyone else out. So that's, ah the other reason for having the 10 to 1 so but it works really well and, and it will make that those mics all sound tighter i believe there you go that's that Bit is of a great cro idea. crossing over from yeah. tv to radio yeah yeah and i like the idea of uh, you said making microphones sound tighter and i know what you mean so that when someone speaks they're heard and that's mm. if, especially if they intend to speak if they tend to speak on mic they get heard they're not artificially pushed down by by something else unless of course it's the host we always want the host to have the control. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is if they if they really shout they suddenly sound distant because their yeah. compressor has yeah. gone down so that ratio you, they get picked up by all the other mics whereas if, right. if it ducks a channel compressor if it can if it ducks a channel compressor chat chat compressor it cleans it up because it effectively ducks everyone else so it yeah it keeps it clean good advice good advice Wow. Well, Rob, I, I hope things can you know, return to uh, to normal in your TV production world. Uh, do you have any mm. any dates later this year that you think things might get normal, or is it just still too early to tell? They're all pencils at the moment. Uh, we have one show potentially uh, that probably won't have an audience. I won't give any any names, but uh, that's that's in July. Um, I've got three more uh, last legs live on uh, Friday nights. Uh, so well, there's one of one of those is tomorrow, uh, but over and above that, we, you know, we really don't know what's happening uh, in terms mm. of whether uh, you know 500 people are going to be let into a TV studio. Frankly, I'm a, I don't know, not sure. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe there'll be a, a seat between everybody or two in a row between yeah. people. And yeah, in the, in that the would be good. Wow. I think if you can just get a little bit of audience reaction, I think it would be worth doing personally. Yeah. Yeah, as you said, twenty or thirty people can uh, can sound good if you get a, if you get a mic near them somewhere. Yeah, enough compression in it. <laughs> yes, Chris Tobin, uh, how are how are things looking in New York? What do you expect over the next few weeks? You think anything's gonna get back to normal or? Uh, how's, how's it oh, look to you? I don't know. I mean, every time I turn on the news, it, there's another another disaster happening, and you know, people are just going a little over the top. If you base it on what they're talking about, the cycles by which we'll phase in the return to normalcy it's about every 14 days which means every two weeks which means here in new york state we're in phase four i believe is our listing so that's about another month or two away before we get anywhere but then they're now claiming that things aren't changing the way they thought they should so now we may be holding off so i don't know you know as rob pointed out it's being penciled i mean we've got things going back and forth it's getting annoying is what it is I have a I have a great idea. How about we just keep doing this week in Radio Tech the same way we've always done it? <laughs> Works for me. I mean, I, I've been walking now. around town. So I've been walking around town, out and, uh, riding the subway, and, uh, and getting to and from job sites and making things happen. So I don't know. It's, it's not impossible to do. Hey, a uh, uh, couple show notes for things that are coming up, um, Chris. If somebody offers to sell you a filter for your C-band satellite receiver, don't buy it yet because they don't actually exist yet. 
at least not the final version of it. So we're going to have some advice coming up on that in the next couple of weeks. Also, there's a there's an old radio museum just up the road or down the road, whatever way you want to speak about it, from Nashville. It's in Kentucky, and it's at a radio station. So in June, we're going to do our show live from this radio museum at a radio station in Kentucky. It's it's pretty fabulous. I can't wait to get up there and, and do the show live from there. We'll have the station engineer and the station owner manager on the show with us talking about uh, this radio museum. So they got, they got a lot of cool stuff. So, Chris, I'm looking forward to it. You stay safe, buddy, okay? Yeah, you do the same. And Rob, be safe as well. And thank you very much for your time. I know it's uh, it's about 10 o'clock your time there, right? Or 10.30 thereabouts? Just going oh, 11. 11. Just going 11. Yeah, I thoroughly 11. enjoyed it. Good, good, good to talk to you guys. Thank you. If we kept him up any later, he'd be in, 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 his, in his pajamas. Rob, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. Chris Tobin, thank All you for right. being here, Fair too. Day, yeah, oh, big, yeah, big yeah. thanks. No, I, huh? I'm just saying, I'm I'm sorry, just go ahead. saying I have a new appreciation for Graham Norton program because I enjoy that show a lot. Now I can actually sit back and enjoy what I'm hearing <laughs> even more. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. We know whose fingers are on the faders now. <laughs> and Thanks to Suncast, our producer, and to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. We got to go. You guys have a great uh, week, and we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye bye.